There were three finalists who were celebrated last night at the Kundal Prize Award Ceremony. John Carlo for his book, The Ottoman Age of Exploration. Dermot McCulloch for his book, A History of Christianity. And Marla Miller for her book, Betsy Ross and the Making of America. All three were winners in the sense that uh, each received, uh, two received a recognition of excellence award with a generous prize of $10,000. And the grand prize winner of wins $75,000 US and will return to McGill next year to deliver the Kundal Lecture. And I am pleased to announce for those of you who do not already know that this year's grand prize winner was Dermot McCulloch for his book, A History of Christianity. And I should mention that all three books, if you didn't notice as you walked in, and as well as books from the last two years are available for purchase. Uh, the members of the jury this year did a fabulous job of selecting the long list and shortlisted books. And I want to recognize the jury members, uh, Catherine Deberat from our own Department of History, McGill alumnus, author, and contributor to The New Yorker, Adam Gopnik, today's speaker and last year's grand prize winner, director of the Center for Editing Lives and Letters at Queen Mary, University of London, Lisa Jardine, Charles Kessler, a professor of government from Claremont McKenna College in California, senior fellow of the Claremont Institute and editor of the Claremont Review of Books, and Ken White, who is the executive vice president of Rogers Publishing. Uh, we hope that most of this year's jury members will sign on for a second year on the jury. Lisa's already told me she will, uh, so she's committed now. Uh, in addition, I'm pleased to announce that the Globe and Mail's national affairs columnist, Jeffrey Simpson, as well as Ramachandra Guha, an author, a columnist, and a fellow of the Indian Institute of Management, uh, will be among next year's jurors. I'd now uh, like to invite uh, Provost Anthony Massey of McGill University to say a few words. Professor Massey. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Thank you all for coming this afternoon uh, to the second annual Kundal Lecture. We are indeed very pleased to have Lisa Jardin back to McGill to deliver this year's lecture. And in a few moments, Professor John Zucchi will speak more about Lisa uh, and, her, and introduce her formally to you. As the Provost of McGill, and that's a title that many of you might not be familiar with, the Provost is the Chief Academic Officer after the Principal and the Chief Budget Officer of the University. I get to attend quite a few functions of this type, uh, but this is really a very exciting one. The Kundal uh, Book Prize and the, the, the fact that it is recognizing and celebrating our humanities disciplines uh, is a really important thing. It's been great to see the Kundal Prize grow over the last three years. Um, it was announced with some fanfare, and it had a very successful launch and a very successful first winner. Um, we now have had, and getting to the short list, 181 books submitted for this prize this year. Uh, and uh, there were 85 different publishers represented uh, in that prize. So having the three finalists uh, with us last night for the award ceremony and, and uh, and, and having uh, Lisa here to present the winner from last year was really w a wonderful occasion for us to celebrate those things. The books themselves are a fascinating mix uh, that really takes us, uh, that gives us an idea of just how broad the scope of the Kundal lectures and the Kundal book prize really is. Um, Marla Miller's book, the great subtitle, The Making of America, Betsy Ross and the Making of America. The subtitles of the books are also an interesting story in themselves. The Ottoman Expansion, I think that age of exploration is a really important way of looking at um, something different in the way in which we have traditionally looked at history. Uh, and uh, History of Christianity, the winning book uh, by uh, Professor McCullough, the first 3,000 years, uh, a history of Christianity. Again, very pro thought-provoking titles and subtitles to these books make us think about just how important uh, the humanities are for us. It, at McGill, we actually have benefited considerably from uh, a number of gifts that have recognized the importance of the humanities. Uh, the very first uh, $5 million endowment for graduate fellowships in, in uh, um, in the Faculty of Arts from the McBride Fellowships, um, Janet Blatchford producing graduate fellowship awards for the iPlay, uh, um, the Institute for the Public Life of Art and Ideas, uh, and of course the Kundal Prize really does allow us to recognize at McGill truly that this is a truly multidisciplinary university. It respects different approaches to research, scholarship, and education 
as long as they reflect the excellence excellence and highest international standards, and the Kundal Prize certainly does that. Um, I would also like to take a moment to thank the jury <laughs> for their noise in the background. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the jury for their enthusiasm and for their exceptional efforts over the summer to evaluate the submitted works and to come up, uh, as it turned out, in Japanese fashion with just-in-time delivery last night at the award ceremony for the winner. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, Professor Chris Manfredi, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, and the whole team from the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, uh, who have provided logistical support for this prize. Uh, and again, thinking about getting 181 books delivered to all of the, the members of the jury and then having to coordinate uh, internationally um, the uh, adjudication and then to uh, actually come up with a winner is no small feat. Um, they have really done an excellent job as the stewards and the caretakers for this Kundal Prize. And I look forward to watching this prize continue to grow and to draw attention to the fact that great historical writing is, can be appreciated not only by academic uh, experts and specialists, but also by non-academics and those of us in academia who are not historians. Um, it does add a considerable amount to my, to my MasterCard bill every time that we see these prizes because I do buy all three of the books uh, and I like to, uh, to try to keep up. Uh, in keeping with the McGill tradition, however, of introducing introducers, uh, John Zuki, a professor and chair of the Department of History and Classical Studies, will now uh, be asked to come up and introduce uh, Lisa Jardin in a moment. He is himself an expert on post-Confederation Canadian history and in particular, the role of migration and ethnicity uh, in the history of Canada. He's a senior editor at McGill Queen's University Press and the general editor of one of the series on ethnic history. Uh, I'd like him to come forward to introduce uh, Lisa Jardin, the winner of the 2009 Kundal Prize for her outstanding work, Going Dutch, again with a great subtitle, How England Plundered Holland's Glory. John. Well, it's a great honor to uh, introduce Professor Lisa Jardine here today, but before I do that, I'd like to say some, a few words about another great project of uh, Mr. Kundal's here at McGill. In addition to the prestigious and generous book prize, Peter Kundal also created the Peter Kundal Fellowships in History at a value of $25,000 offered to outstanding graduate students entering the doctoral program in the History and Classical Studies Department and four students have thus far benefited tremendously from these fellowships. You know, there's Saul Guerrero, who's working on the role of glass trade, trade beads in the early modern Atlantic markets. Ariane Cote, on the rapport du pouvoir dans la société de Louisiane Française à travers l'étude d'une communauté d'esclaves. Catherine Ulmer, who was working on the formation of the welfare state in Canada in the 1940s. And Sarah Gabriel, who's working on the mission libératrice, colonial anti-slavery in French Algeria and the Comoros Islands in the 19th century. On behalf of the Department of History, I really wish to express our very deep appreciation and gratitude to Mr. Kundal for these fellowships, and we do hope that we'll be able to extend this great, great program. As you know, Professor Lisa Jardine is a second recipient of the Kundal History Prize for her truly wonderful book, Going Dutch, How England Plundered Holland's Glory. And in keeping with our now established McGill tradition, everyone knows that we invent traditions, they become traditions very soon. It was two years or three years, I guess, into, the, into this uh, Kundal uh, uh, prize. Well, the, uh, the winner of the previous year's prize returns to Montreal to give the Kundal lecture. That is why we are so fortunate to have Professor Jardine here with us today. And it's only two months after your last visit to our mm -hmm. campus, right, <laughs> for the Lauren Gale's lecture. That's right. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> Lisa Jardine is Centenary Professor of Renaissance Studies at Queen Mary, University of London. She is a Fellow of the Royal Historical Society and an Honorary Fellow of King's College, Cambridge and Jesus College, Cambridge, and holds honorary doctorates from the University of St. Andrews, Sheffield Hellen University, and the Open University. She is a trustee of the Victoria and Albert Museum and was for five years a member of the Council of the Royal Institution. She is patron of the Archives and Records Association and the Orange Prize. 
Many accomplishments. This is going to go on for a while. But I've cut a lot, too. <laughs> Professor Jardine is a regular writer and presenter of a point of view on BBC Radio 4. She judged the 1996 Whitbread Prize, the 1999 Guardian First Book Award, and the 2000 Orwell Prize, and was chair of judges for the 1997 Orange Prize and the 2002 Man Booker Prize. Lisa Jardine has published over 50 scholarly articles in refereed journals and books, and 17 books, both for an academic and for a general readership. Some of them are household names, you know, Worldly Goods, A New History of the Renaissance, Ingenious Pursuits, Building a Scientific Revolution, and biographies of Sir Christopher Wren and Robert Hooke. During the first semester of 2008-2009 uh, academic year, she was a distinguished visiting professor at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study in the Humanities and Social Sciences, and last academic year, she was a Scaliger Visiting Fellow at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands and held the Sarton Chair and received the Sarton Medal at the University of Ghent in Belgium. And besides all this, I hear you love cooking too, right? <laughs> so, in going Dutch, Lisa Jardine traced the way in which English and Dutch cultures were altered in the course of the 17th century, preparing the ground for a seamless takeover of the English crown by William III in 1688 1689. In her Kundal lecture, she's going to look at, at events surrounding that, that invasion of 1688 through a stronger lens and show how the careers of the Huggins brothers, you should have met them if you haven't encountered them yet, buy the book on the way out, okay? The Huggins brothers, Constantine, uh, who was secretary to William III, and Christian, who was a distinguished scientist. She shows how they were altered, their careers were altered by the invasion in important ways, and she's going to show how we ought to consider the post-invasion rise of Sir Isaac Newton in a different light if we link his dealings with the Huggins brothers. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a warm welcome for our 2010 Kundal Prize lecturer, Professor Lisa Jardine. Thank you very much. I always feel tired when someone's read out my biography. I'd like to start, as everyone else has, but surely there are not enough thanks, uh, by thanking Peter Cundill, who I'm privileged now to have met and spent an afternoon with, um, for uh, giving us this prize. I'd also like to say that having now served on the jury, and I gather I'm going to serve again, um, that I am really humbled by having read the selections. You know, it's one thing to win, um, because, of course, you think your book is best, don't you, Giancarlo? <laughs> um, but um, then to realize what you were up against, really what you were up against, is quite extraordinary. It's an extraordinary prize. Um, I guarantee you that within 10 years it will have the renown it deserves, the renown of the Man Booker or the Pulitzer Prize. Believe me, Peter Kundal, it really will. Um, and uh, many of us will be doing our best to make sure it does so. Um, I, in the midst of all those um, gaddings around this year that uh, were just described, on September the 2nd this year, my mother died uh, in her 93rd year, um, which involved two more journeys to California, as uh, the Cundill Prize organizers know. And I'd like to dedicate uh, this lecture to my mother, Rita Bernowski. Thank you. On the 1st of November, 1688, Dutch style, which to my delight, I'm a terrible digressor in lectures, I realize is today because of the lost 10 days, um, or sorry, the 1st of November, the Dutch fleet set off, Dutch time. The 5th of November, it arrived off Torbay um, off to invade the British Isles. Um, the 5th is the 15th. Um, and therefore, um, we are actually celebrating the invasion of Britain today. I think all Canadians should give a little cheer. <laughs> On the 1st of November, 1688, driven onwards at speed by a strong easterly wind, a vast Dutch fleet left its sheltered harbor in Helvetsluis and sailed out into open waters. At a signal from Prince William of Orange, the great gathering of ships organized itself into prearranged format stretching, we are told, the whole fleet in a line from Dover to Calais, 25 deep. The Dutch began their mission, colors flying, 
The fleet, quote, in its greatest splendor, a vast mass of sail stretching as far as the eye could see, the warships on either flank simultaneously thundering their guns in salute as they passed in full view of Dover Castle on one side and the French garrison at Calais on the other. As the great flotilla proceeded magnificently on its way, the Dutch regiments stood in full parade formation on the deck while, quote, trumpets and drums played various tunes to rejoice their hearts for above three hours. Another quote, we arrived between Dover and Calais and at midday as we passed along the channel, we could see distinctly the high white cliffs of England, but the coast of France could be seen only faintly. These colorful details come from the personal diary in Dutch of Constantine Huygens, Jr. Now, I'm going to stop for a minute. Constant, I, I have learned my years in Holland to say Hauchens, right? It's Constantine Hauchens. But I'm not going to bore you with that or, or confuse you. Uh, the English knew him as Mr. Huggins, and the French called him Monsieur Huygens, and we seem to have settled in Europe for Huygens, so I'm going to call him Huygens, okay? It's the Huygenses. But think Huggins. These colorful details come from the personal diary in Dutch of Constantine Huygens, Jr., Prince William's first secretary, and older brother to Christian Huygens, the virtuoso and scientist. Constantine was at the very forefront of the action throughout the Dutch invasion, so it's hardly surprising that other members of his family back in The Hague were particularly interested in unfolding events. So let us eavesdrop on their conversation for a minute. The conversation between this man, eldest son, Constantine Huygens, and this man, Christian Huygens, his slightly younger brother. On the 30th of December, so that's a month, pretty much, uh, two months after the beginning of the uh, expedition, Christian Huygens wrote to Constantine, his brother, expressing his relief at having at last heard about the invasion and that it and the military campaign against the forces of James II of England had resulted in a decisive victory. And I'm going to read these letters because they're familiar letters, they're family letters, they're letters that, as far as I know, nobody's quoted from extensively before. These are letters exchanged between two brothers, Constantine, this one, the political man, first secretary to William of Orange, William, to be William III in London, now in London, and Christian in The Hague, his second, the second brother. And they wrote uh, um, avidly to one another, and huge numbers of their letters survive. And the ones that I'm using here are in the archive of the University of Leiden. So here is Christian in The Hague writing to his brother, who's with this military campaign, but has only just been heard from. It's been extremely upsetting that there's been no way of getting news of you by letter since during your long absence. But thank God things will improve from now on. At least the English roads will no longer be blocked. You may well, well imagine with what delight we have learned of the great and happy success of affairs there after all the anxieties and apprehensions since the beginning of this expedition, both because of the dangers at sea and the uncertain prospect for the war. For even though since your departure the news has always been reasonably good, we continued to anticipate a military engagement as long as King James's army remained on its feet. And we couldn't imagine a reversal as sudden as the one which has taken place since the extremely fortunate retreat, which you did not yet even know about when you wrote your last letter to Madame, your wife. Now we wait impatiently for news of your arrival in London and of the reception they will give to Monsieur the Prince, which will no doubt be something marvelous to see. What a joy for the nation and what glory for him to have been successful in such a noble and bold enterprise. We will learn after that how everything is to be established and organized, both over there and back here, which is no, not a small thing to wait for. We're not sure whether you will return here or stay there where you are, which causes embarrassment for a certain lady of your acquaintance. I don't think that's Constantine's wife. I think that's his love interest back in The Hague. And I should say to you that uh, some of these letters are in French. This is a letter in French. Some of them are in Dutch. 
Um, uh, but mostly the brothers exchange their, um, their personal views in French, interestingly enough, although, as I say, the diary was in Dutch, and from time to time they drop into Dutch. Brother Constantine was now installed in London in a key administra administrative position in the occupying government. I mean, I, when I say this in England, a shudder runs through the room. We were occupied. There were soldiers on every public building. It was a, an occupation for 18 months, and all British troops were uh, relegated to the countryside, weren't allowed to come within 15 miles of, of London. So uh, Constantine is part of this occupying force which has not yet become the new monarchy. Shortly to be proclaimed King William III, joint monarch of England with his wife, Princess Mary Stuart, the daughter of the deposed English king. Both brothers, by the way, were fluent English speakers. Their father, Sir Constantine Huygens, having been a lifelong Anglophile. And William III, too, had had a bilingual upbringing. So, in fact, the, what I was working with on this archive is in English, French, and Dutch, um, and Latin, I suppose. Um, and they all speak it all four beautifully. The Dutch success was so sudden and dramatic and caused such a general political stir that Christian, remember the one in The Hague, the scientist, announced it might even tempt him to join his brother in England. He writes, if you stay over there, you will see that towards the spring there will be a good many people who will take a trip to England and perhaps I shall be among them. Christian's keen interest in life in London, now as I say, officially an occupied city, is palpable. And incidentally, during this period, I, I'm just trying to get you to, to sort of get the atmosphere of these two brothers trying to decide which side of what they call the Narrow Sea they want to be on in this period, um, is that there was considerable violence during this period. I, I wish I had known that when I wrote my book. It's not in Going Dutch. <clears throat> it's in um, a more recent um, book simply called 1688, um, which has some wonderful documentary evidence of particularly anti-Catholic violence. Um, in uh, London and the provinces during the, the period that we're talking about. With vicarious enjoyment, Christian urges his brother to take every advantage of his new position in order to make acquaintance of the English virtuosi, the scientists associated with the Royal Society, whom Christian had already met on several occasions. He tells him to get to know them without delay, and it's clear that Christian is envying Constantine his opportunity. He writes to Constantine, who incidentally hadn't the slightest interest in science. In time, you will get to know the most eminent men in London and those who understand our great art of lens grinding and telescope making. A Mr. Smethick once sent me some of his lenses, which were, however, only ocular ones, and claimed that he knew better how to make them than many others. I think the Royal Society is on a long vacation at the moment. However, you might have the opportunity of seeing Mr. Robert Boyle and others of the members. I would love to be in Cambridge just to get to know Mr. Newton. I greatly admire the beautiful inventions I find in the work he sent me. That's the Principia. I could send you a letter for him, which you might easily find an opportunity to deliver to him. And here are some of the letters. Uh, these are the letters exchanged between, it says, for Broer Huygens on the front of that one, and uh, for Broer Huygens on the one sideways. And you can amuse yourself doing the paleography while I'm speaking. By February 1689, 1689, so we've reached the end of 1688, we're into the beginning of 1689, Christian was receiving vivid accounts from scientific acquaintances of the high level of intellectual excitement in London that the invasion had brought. So yes, it was an occupation, but also it's generated enormous intellectual ferment in the capital of, in, in London. It's evident that Christian is increasingly envious of his older brother's good fortune in being part of unfolding events. Meanwhile, The Hague was rapidly emptying of influential political figures and intellectuals who were crossing the narrow seas to England 
as the political center of gravity shifted to London with the Orange faction. And that is also what happened when James I came to the throne after the death of Elizabeth I. You have to imagine an entire intelligentsia and political elite upping sticks and decamping to the new center of power. Um, and somebody asked me at dinner last night, um, in addition to the plundering, how come uh, uh, Dutch fortunes waned after 1688? And to some quite large extent, it's because as you're going to hear Christian describing, everybody of any importance left The Hague, the center of political activity in the Netherlands, in order to go to London, where it was all going to be happening, and which was, of course, another bilingual, or trilingual, English, French, Dutch um, milieu. On the 5th of February, 1689, on the eve of Princess Mary's departure from the Netherlands to join her husband William in England for the joint coronation, Christian wrote again to Constantine. He just heard that his brother might decide not to remain in the service of William, but to return to the Netherlands. Christian counseled him to be cautious before taking this course of action, because there were likely to be very few jobs back home for the foreseeable future. Here too, as in several other letters, he expresses the view that the English stood to gain far more than the Dutch from the invasion. And I quote, Madam, the Princess Mary will leave here in two days, so they say, as long as the wind is favorable. And one can see by the number of the best houses which are to let and by the decline in rents in general, how deserted the Hague will be. In the end, it's going to be only England who will profit from this great revolution. And the only advantage we here will derive from it, I think, is that without it, we would have fallen upon worse times still. And I'm, I'm really reading these letters because this isn't how the history is told, really, either by the English or by the Dutch for this period. There's something so much more intimate, at least I think so, about the way in which people express their hopes and fears in their private family letters. Here is uh, Princess Mary, decked out in orange, of course, hideous color to have to wear all the time, but there she is in orange, um, the, the, of the House of Orange, which of course is orange, nothing to do with the color, but to do with orange, which was the, um, the source of the House of Orange's um, uh, entitlement to be treated as princes. They were prince of this, if anyone's been to orange, it's not much of a principality, um, but uh, that allowed the, um, the House of Orange to stand in the presence of other royalty, very, very important for doing political business. On the 15th of March, 1689, writing this time to his younger brother, Lodovic, in Rotterdam, Christian Huygens reported that Constantine did now look likely to stay in London. And once again, Christian affirmed his own intention of join, joining him. Quote, it seems from his last letters he no longer shows a desire to quit, that his majesty, King William, treats him very well, as if planning to retain him. As for myself, I've often wondered whether in such a case I might not obtain a position to improve my own fortune, and I've already decided to cross the sea for this purpose. But Brother Constantine has written to his wife that in six weeks, of which three are already passed, His Majesty might make a triumphant tour of this country, that is the Netherlands, for which reason I'm deferring my trip. In fact, William didn't go back and do a triumphant tour of the Netherlands. And here, because I'm talking about them, more of them, this is the Huygens family with Sir Constantine in the middle, little Susanna at the top, and the four boys, uh, Constantine, Christian, Lodovic, and the fourth one who died. Um, and we don't quite know which is which, although I, w well, I have my views, but there isn't any consensus. But that's the family, so that you can see the family, and um, just so that you get the family straight, that's Sir Constantine with his wife, Susanna Van Barla, who in fact died um, giving birth to Susanna. So um, she's there, a sort of ghost in that picture. I'm going to go back to the family picture for a minute. So Christian writes to Lodovic that he's deferred his trip, um, uh, but he still intends to go. And I'm slightly laboring this because there's lots of books on Christian Huygens, and I've written about him myself. And we've always said that Christian was reclusively sickly um, in the country during this period, um, and that he only eventually made one trip to England because he couldn't bear not to meet 
Isaac Newton and discuss the Principia. What I'm actually going to unfold for you now um, is uh, the, ver the rather different story, what really happened, why Christian, uh, you're beginning to hear, Christian went to London to try and get a job. Why did he go to London to try and get a job? Because things were looking pretty bleak in the Netherlands and particularly in The Hague. And, um, and uh, uh, well, the outcome you'll see shortly. He's deferred his trip. It's a shame, Christian adds at the end of this letter presciently, that Prince William has so little love of the study of the sciences. Were this not the case, I should have higher hopes for myself. In May, again writing to Lodovic, Christian once more makes it clear that if Constantine will only make up his mind to accept a senior post in the Anglo-Dutch regime, he too would like an English appointment, and he means a political appointment. If Constantine is to stay in England, I would resolve to transplant myself there also by obtaining some benefice or pension through his influence. As it is, I can avoid the pain and expense of such a journey, but I'm still undecided. So Christian's still vacillating. After Christian returned from the trip, which as we shall see he did finally make to England shortly thereafter, he kept pressing his older brother with increasing insistence to support his efforts to get significant administrative office under William III. And he did so because he now had other than intellectual motives. In addition to his desire to be where the political and intellectual action was, he found himself financially embarrassed by the high level of taxation being levied on the Dutch to support the English invasion and its aftermath. And that was the second thing I told my neighbor last night about why Dutch fortunes had declined, um, which was that William rather deftly kept raising what was effectively a poll tax. The Dutch were the first um, to have a per capita levy um, because the people of Holland understood that without the dikes and without the sea defenses, they didn't have a country. And so um, it's sort of a very interesting psychology that therefore the, the people of the Netherlands um, were um, prepared to give a percentage of their income to ensure that those dikes were kept up. So at this point, um, William is taking that income, which is significant. He's moved to London. Um, he's ostensibly defending the, boundary, the borders of the Netherlands against the French, um, but in actual fact, he's uh, investing uh, in uh, finance in London, which will eventually lead to the Bank of England. Um, and I'm sure there are Dutch people in this audience who would give a slightly different version of the story, but it's pretty much the case, I think. So um, Christian is now struggling with the level of taxation in, uh, in The Hague. I hope you will give me your assistance in this affair. It's the first with which I've ever troubled you, he says, and he's writing um, here to Constantine. I would not harbor ambitions like this, that is ambitions to a political post, if I didn't believe that it's impossible for me to subsist honestly with the little I have in this period of exacting taxation of which there is no end in sight. For the rest, this post that I want to get, which was a rather small, humble post, um, that had fallen vacant in William's regime, is honorable and not very demanding, which would mean I didn't have to give up my scientific studies. I don't believe that anyone will doubt that I'm able to carry out its duties. I beg you, therefore, not to lose this opportunity to put me a little more at my ease, for in truth, I can see nothing in this country which is suitable for me. These Intimate and candid exchanges between the members of the Huygens family suggest a rather different set of motives for the visit Christian eventually made to London from June to August 1689. We've been looking at correspondence between December and February uh, 1689. The, the coronation was in, I think it's April, um, and then, oh no, it's later. Um, uh, and, uh, but Christian does eventually come in and spends three months, June to August 1689. So these exchanges I'm suggesting give a rather different color or flavor to the visit he eventually made from those conventionally described by historians of science. I have, as I said myself, previously described this trip in terms of Christian having come briefly out of retirement, being tempted out of retirement. From my recent closer scrutiny of these and other letters to his brothers, and these are letters I've looked at since I finished the book, um, which is sort of filling out um, some of the, the gaps that inevitably um, I left in that book. 
From my recent closer scrutiny of these letters to his brothers, it looks rather as if Christian seriously harbored hopes of starting his public career again. That career had ended in 1685 with the death of his patron Colbert in Paris when uh, Christian had a nervous breakdown and uh, was brought back by his family to the Netherlands. Um, but the, the nervous breakdown was to do with the fact that he was a, 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 a Netherlander in France and France and Holland were at war. One of the three countries was at war with one of the other, England, France, and Holland throughout this period. And this is um, Sir Constantine the Father in old age, which I just like because we always forget that people do indeed age. This is him at the A. He died in 1687, um, but uh, this, is, uh, this is him in his 80s. So um, this is the father at the time in which his eldest son becomes um, the, the first secretary to William. So Christian, when he is actually pestering his brother Constantine in London with successive letters uh, to try and get this political post, for which, by the way, he was wholly unsuited, and his brother knew there was very little chance of his being able to get it for him, um, he had, by, by this time, Christian had domestic reasons for wanting to relocate and to revive his public career, too. As I say, their father, Sir Constantine, had died 18 months earlier, on the 28th of March, 1687, at which point Christian, who had lived with his father in their rather grand house in Het Plain, which is the one, oh, I'm pointing at my screen, uh, there. One is the Moritz house, that's that, yes, that's the Moritz house, and that's um, that, that, the Huygens' house in Het Plain. And the boys used to um, climb through the hedge between the two houses. They were built by the same architect. Um, Christian had had to leave the house when his father died, as tradition decreed, so that Constantine Jr., his older brother, now in London, who was the new heir of Anzulikem, the new head of the family, um, could take up residence there with his family. And Christian had had to retire to the country, to this rather famous little house at Vorburg, Hofwick, um, which Sir Constantine had built for his um, pastoral retreat um, and which actually still survives at Vorburg in the Netherlands, although the train track now runs right past it. Um, so this is where Christian was living um, and he didn't like it there one bit. He was soon regretting the isolation I have so far stayed at Hofwick and intend to remain here for the whole winter. There are unpleasant evenings when the weather is bad, but I suppose one can get used to anything, he wrote to Constantine Jr. He took to staying in the family house in The Hague during the winter months, and eventually he rented his own accommodation in Nordlinde there. So this is why Christian's trying to get to London. Finally, and this is much closer to the traditional background account of his 1689 prolonged stay in London, Christian makes it clear, writing to Constantine, that he's anxious to take advantage of Constantine's residence in England in order to reconnect with his old scientific friends. Just before the coronation of William and Mary, he writes to Constantine, I informed you in one of my previous letters that I had the intention of coming to see you, and perhaps I will execute that plan shortly, not in order to attend the coronation, but to see old friends, as well as some who have settled there recently, and to see what they're doing in the way of science in London, Oxford, and Cambridge, in all of which places I'm quite well known. Here, since your departure, there's not a single person I can talk to about things of that nature. And here's Robert Boyle whom he had met on a previous visit, very anxious to meet again. But it was above all Sir Isaac Newton, whom Christian Huygens now badly wanted to meet. For two years, he'd been working through sections of Newton's Principia, of which the author had sent him a presentation copy, facilitated by the intellectual go-between Fatio de Duillet, who was uh, for a short while um, allegedly Newton's partner, uh, and who facilitates between the two communities in Holland and, um, and England throughout this period. Wish I had more time to tell you more about him, but I, you just have to, his name will pop in from time to time, and I'm happy to tell anybody about him if we have questions at the end. Uh, this picture is actually, it was a bit dark, isn't it? 
pity. But he's quite a handsome fellow, wasn't he? That's, that's Newton in 1689. It's important that it's Newton in 1689 because 1689 is the point at which Sir Isaac Newton stops being a recluse and becomes a major um, uh, mover and shaker in the new government in, uh, in England. It was above all Sir Isaac Newton whom Christian Huygens wanted to meet. He'd been working through the Principia. Christian had engaged with the dense mathematical calculations and bold theorems in the Principia with increasing excitement and admiration. We've already heard Christian telling Constantine that he greatly admired the beautiful inventions he found in the work he sent me. Um, Newton had sent Christian Huygens a presentation copy. And Fatio de Duye had seen to it that Christian was already full of eager anticipation even before that copy arrived. Fatio had sent him a synopsis of its contents before it was even published. And in a letter to Fatio, Christian writes in 1687, just before the publication um, in uh, 1688, let us get hold of Newton's book for God's sake. So um, I don't know if any of you have ever looked at the Principia. It's not a book many people would get overexcited about, I think it could be said probably second only to Newton's theory of relativity as um, a, a non-bedtime reading book. And there it is, the frontispiece of the Principia. As a respected continental virtuoso, Christian, once he'd got his hands on the Principia and read it attentively, had made his high opinion of it widely known, in letters, of course, in writing. Um, when John Locke came to visit him at Hofwick and asked him if he thought the mathematics were sound, Locke admitted he couldn't follow them at all. Christian told him emphatically they were certainly to be trusted. Newton, to whom Locke recounted this, proudly repeated the Dutch mathematician's endorsement in London and wrote to all his friends about it. So you get this circulating reputation, Huygens endorsing Newton, Newton being um, respectful of Christian Huygens, um, and so now we're, we're, we're revving up for the point at which the two of them have a proper mature meeting. A visit to London would at last allow Huygens to meet Newton face to face. More importantly, since Newton's irascible nature was legendary, the great man would be predisposed to enter into debate with this Dutchman who was so publicly enthusiastic about his book. This represents William and Mary. It's my favorite representation. The porcelain busts, they're in the um, Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And, um, I, 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 could, I could rob a museum to own them. They're sort of about that big. The Prince of Orange arrived in England in November 1688 with a formidable army. I'm just preparing the ground for, um, we've got the letters now, we have the letters. And I just want to tell you, those of you who've read my book already will um, uh, have a sense of this, but for those of you who haven't, um, why um, it, the, why the ease of movement at this point, 1688, between the two um, locations? The Prince of Orange arrived in England with a formidable army, but he also came, prepared for his encounter with the English, with a fully formed outlook and set of attitudes. A robust set of common interests and commitments had developed over at least the preceding half century between a certain sort of Englishman and his Dutch counterpart. While there was always an edge of suspicion, there had after all been three Anglo-Dutch wars since the 1650s, there was also a great deal of recognizably shared experience, particularly in the realm of arts and letters. And I give you a small episode on that road leading from Torbay where the huge army landed to London where William took the throne of England. I take a small episode en route to underline the importance of this shared mentality. Constantine Huygens Jr., remember he's with Prince William, this is his Dutch diary, he is his right-hand man on this trek from, and he, and he documents every single day. Um, uh, Constantine Huygens Jr. records that in the course of the often arduous and demanding forced march from Torbay to London, it rained the whole time. Welcome to England. Right? Um, in the course of that forced march, William of Orange took time off from military affairs to do a bit of tourism and encouraged his secretary to do likewise. On the 4th of December, so they've been in the country, um, they've been on the, on the march um, for a month, um, 
he insisted on making a detour to admire Wilton House near Salisbury, the country seat of the Earl of Pembroke. Wilton was renowned for its architecture, its art, but most of all for its magnificent gardens, designed in the 1640s by Isaac de Caus. Engravings of the Wilton Gardens had appeared in, lavishly illustrated, in a lavishly illustrated book entitled Hortus Pembrokeanus, Garden of the Earl of Pembroke, first published in 1645-6 to and reprinted several times thereafter, in one case without any of the accompanying text, but simply as a coffee table book, as a set of engravings. The book is closely modelled on a famous volume brought out 25 years earlier than that by Isaac de Caus's brother Solomon, depicting the fabulous gardens he'd designed at Heidelberg for the Winter King and Queen, the Elector Frederick Palatine, and his wife, Charles I's sister, Elizabeth of Bohemia. Both books were familiar to a keen gardens enthusiast like Prince William. Heidelberg's garden had been destroyed during the Thirty Years' War, along with the city's great university and its library. In the midst of a military campaign on foreign soil, William took time off at the earliest possible opportunity to go and look at the Pembroke Gardens in all their glory and at some length. Constantine Huygens records the detour made for this purpose, and this is from his diary. We marched from Hendon to Salisbury, 13 miles, a good way through Salisbury Plain, but for a long time we had a cold, sharp wind blowing directly in our faces. A mile from Salisbury, we passed an undistinguished village called Wilton, where the Earl of Pembroke has a beautiful house, which is moderately beautiful because there are some very notable paintings by Van Dyck. His Highness went to see it, but I did not. I was in a hurry to get to town and get warm. William may have been anxious to see the Van Dykes, at least one of which showed his mother as a child with her siblings, but the gardens were far more impressive than the house. Laid out and planted before the house itself was built, as was customary for the period, the Wilton Gardens had been designed to complement a classical villa on a grand scale. By the time the house was constructed, the fourth earl's fortunes had faded and a more modest house eventually presided over the parterres and wildernesses, statues and elaborate fountains. Wilton House's artwork and gardens were entirely to the monarch-to-be's Dutch taste. The weather was abominable, but that in no way dampened the Stadtholder's enthusiasm. Rejoining Constantine Huygens the following day, William told Constantine the house and garden were as outstanding as he'd been led to believe. And Constantine writes, in the evening the prince, prince was in his room coughing violently, having caught a cold in the gardens. He told me I absolutely must go and see the house at Wilton. Huygens did want to go to Wilton, but my horse was not available. He went on foot to see Salisbury Cathedral instead. So the milieu, that's why I take that episode, the milieu, what the French call the, would call the cadre, were familiar, was familiar to the two Huygens brothers on both sides of the channel. And I choose this as my example. I was just at a, um, a sale in London, a Sotheby's sale. Um, this is why a, a tulip pyramid vase stands about that high, um, is one of a pair. Um, and two of them were up for sale the week before last yeah, from the um, house, Ashdown House, the house of the Duke of Craven, the Earl of Craven, from this same period. So, you know, William could have walked into any house um, of an, the aristocracy in Britain, felt totally at home. The porcelain would have been identical, would have been the same. The tulips would have been the same. Um, uh, they, they were comfortable with one another, the Dutch and the English. So... Now, as we draw uh, the threads together, let us shift our attention from that fascinating exchange of familiar letters and reassess what did happen on the occasion of the trip that Huygens, Christian Huygens eventually made to England. Both Huygens brothers, fortunately, kept diaries for this period, one in French and one in Dutch. So we know Christian have arrived in Harwich on the 1st of June, 1689, having traveled from The Hague with Constantine uh, Junior's wife and son, so they were settling in London. So he came with the with the rest of Constantine's uh, family. Now that uh, the king was crowned, well, was about to be crowned, and everything was settled, they reached London five days later. Constantine recorded in his diary for the sixth of June. While I was seated at table in Whitehall Palace, my wife, son, and brother arrived, and to my great joy, all in good health. 
In the afternoon, we looked over one or two lodgings with them, and Cousin Becca took one with Mrs. Rowe, widow of Sir Robert Rowe, and spoke with the daughter. Our rooms, together with those of Brother Christian, cost 33 guilders per week. We moved in straight away after we'd been out shopping. Plus ça change. <clears throat> The whole family frequented the court of William and Mary at Hampton Court, where the couple had taken up official residence because the sea coal pollution at Whitehall exacerbated William's asthma. So from his arrival, Christian found himself at the very heart of unfolding political events in England, part of the new Dutch royal elite, ruling elite, royal elite, something that you're not usually told about um, Christian Huygens, that he had entered the royal family because his brother was um, the first uh, attaché to the king. I might add that Christian's diary reveals that he spent the greater part of his almost three months in England not doing any science at all, but enjoying the kinds of recreational activities, gambling, trips to stately home, flirting, seducing actually, musical entertainment, that you would expect a courtier to engage in. And this, just to give you the character, this is the facade of um, uh, Hampton Court, Sir Christopher Wren's um, uh, addition to the old buildings. At, um, uh, and uh, this is a Dutch painting of Windsor Castle from the same period, another tourist um, uh, attraction. But of course, um, Christian was going to them um, as a uh, not, not as somebody to gawp at royalty, but he was actually staying in these palaces. He was going and staying. Um, if I had more time, I'd tell you that his father had done the same thing uh, 70 years earlier. So Christian visited Wren's new buildings, <clears throat> the nearly completed St. Paul's, the monument to the Great Fire, the temple and Bedlam, Bethlehem Hospital, by those last all uh, built by Ro Robert Hooke. There were trips to Windsor Castle where Christian admired various ceiling paintings in St. George's Chapel. You could only get into St. George's Chapel then as now if you were royalty or friend of royalty. And outings taken, and he went on outings to take the waters at Epsom and to visit John Evil in the Diaries home at Deptford with its remarkable garden. On a gambling evening at Epsom in the company of Constantine and his wife, Christian won a silver ewer worth ten and a half guineas. He went to the theater and to several musical soirees, during one of which he listened to French opera and an accomplished flautist. Towards the end of his day, he also embarked on an amorous liaison with a Miss Purnell, the intimate details of which are concealed behind a series of indecipherable coded entries in Christian's diary. It was from this position of relaxed public and uh, relaxed privilege, court privilege and public prominence and with the authority of his brother and the king behind him that on the 12th of June 1689 shortly after his arrival Christian travelled by boat back along the Thames to Gresham College to attend a meeting of the Royal Society a very well documented meeting of the scientific establishment at which, Constantine, at which Christian actually Constantine was there at which Christian and Isaac Newton were both present and Robert Hooke and Christopher Wren. As he recorded in his diary, as Christian recorded, this meeting was in strong contrast to the glamour of the rest of the life he was leading. To Gresham College, he writes, meeting in a pokey room, small room. Cabinet of Curiosities, extensive but poorly maintained. Hoskins presided, Henshaw was one of the principals. Halley, Van Leeuwenhoek's letter delivered, I was accompanied by Mr. Newton and Mr. Fazio. This diary tells us that Christian has by now met Newton, formally introduced, one imagines, by Fatio de Duye. Two weeks later, having returned to Hampton Court, Christian Huygens' diary, that's Christian the scientist, records that he had an audience with King William and dined with the king's Dutch favorite, William Bentinck, Earl of Portland, another orange sash, um, the most powerful man at court. It had been suggested beforehand that as an ex esteemed virtuoso, particularly well connected with the Dutch royal household, Christian might now intervene with William III on Isaac Newton's behalf, putting the mathematician's name forward for a senior promotion. Two days later, according to Constantine's diary, Christian acted directly on Newton's behalf a second time. 
once again the Dutch faction intervening decisively in the lives of English subjects, and let me tell you this doesn't crop up in the lives of Isaac Newton, so we're getting from the correspondence and the diaries, interaction between the two nations here of a kind that's completely concealed from the public record. So this is Constantine's diary, 10th of July, Brother Christian went to London with young Mr. Hamden, Fatio de Duye, and Mr. Isaac Newton at seven in the morning with the purpose of recommending Mr. Newton to the king for a vacancy as head of a Cambridge college. On the 28th of July, Christian attended a fashionable concert at which Hamden introduced him to the Duke of Somerset, Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, and Newton's preferment was once more discussed. This is from Christian's diary. To Hampton Court to speak to the king dined with Mr. Bentinck, Count of Portland, slept at Dutton. Mr. Haddon presented me and invoked my expertise in favor of Mr. Newton, on whose behalf he was importuning his majesty. Here is Christian Huygens, according to both diaries, engaged in serious, not to say significant business. He was prominently and personally involved in the political game of snakes and ladders, as a result of which Isaac Newton, hitherto a reclusive intellectual and a comparatively minor political figure, moved center stage, which is where Newton remained for the rest of his life. His brother Constantine's diary confirms the importance generally that was attached to this intervention of Christians. The Cambridge College, whose headship Newton had ambitions to fill, was King's, and the court lobbyist on Newton's behalf who approached Huygens was John Hamden, a leading, par leading parliamentary player. Huygens' approach evidently had the desired approach. Shortly thereafter, William III wrote to the fellows of King's, informing them of his desire that they appoint Newton as their new provost. There was only, however, so far given university politics and believe, politics, believe me, nothing changes. I'm sure it's the same here. There was, there was only so far that such influential lobbying could take a candidate. The new foreign king was roundly rebuffed by the fellows of kings who chose another candidate. Nevertheless, Newton's public career was clearly in the ascendant thanks in no small part to the brothers Huygens. And here's Newton, much more distinguished um, towards the end of his career. Newton knew all about image making. I think there are 350 portraits of Newton, all uh, commissioned by himself, pretty much. <laughs> Even though this direct attempt by Christian Huygens to advance Newton's career proved unsuccessful, it significantly strengthened the relationship between the two men and with it the intensity of the intellectual bond between them. In August, just before Christian went home, Newton presented him with two papers on motion through a resisting medium in response to Christian's paper, Discours de la cause de la pesanteur. Autographed copies of these papers marked received in London, August 1690, by Huygens survive. And Huygens' notes of response also survived. The two men had lengthy discussions of optics and color. Huygens told Leibniz that Newton had communicated, quote, some very beautiful experiments to him, probably his experiments with thin films, similarly to the ones Huygens had performed 20 years earlier, and similar to those uh, Robert Hooke had recorded in his Micrographia even earlier than that. In the domain of science and virtuosity, Christian didn't confine himself to constructing a solid relationship with Newnham, Newnham, Newton. In pursuit of his general aim of re-establishing his connections with the London scientific virtuosi, he did indeed see Robert Boyle and was shown experiments that delighted him in the field of what we would call chemistry, but in the period was actually closer to alchemy saw Mr. Boyle three times. On the last occasion, he showed us an, an experiment with two cold liquids which burst into flame when they were combined. He'd moistened a piece of wool in a silver spoon with the first, which had a strong smell, almost like oil of anise. The other, which was poured onto it, was in a tiny vial and gave off fumes when the stopper was removed. And this is just the frontispiece of an early work by Boyle, the skeptical chemist. By the beginning of 1689, Newton was emerging as one of the most prominent Protestant supporting members of the Cambridge University community with impeccable credentials to serve the incoming regime. Uh, his impeccable credentials were that he had opposed James II fiercely uh, in the university uh, in the years leading up to James's um, uh, abdication. Following the, convention, the coronation of William and Mary, the convention to which Newton had been appointed became the convention parliament, and Newton remained in the capital um, 
not returning to Cambridge until January 1690. Nevertheless, Christian Huygens' intervention with the new Dutch king was of no small importance to Newton. It helped ensure when the two of them went together to that meeting on the Royal Society on the 12th of June, much reported and commented on, as I say, in the history of science literature, that it was Huygens' contributions to, of gravity and light to which Newton attended seriously. I'm, I think I'm making a point there about politics and science. Robert Hooke was there at the same time, devastated, annoyed, uh, indignant that his contribution wasn't paid any attention to, but that's because his star was in the political descendant and um, uh, Newton's was in the political ascendant and it was national politics that was deciding who got listened to uh, at the Royal Society. We tend to be told that Christian Huygens retreated to his self-imposed life as an intellectual invalid when he returned from that trip in August to The Hague. Indeed, I've said that. I've said as much. In fact, as we've seen, he made serious, not to say energetic, efforts to re-enter mainstream social life and to revive his international scientific activities. He eventually moved from Hofwick, as I said, to rented rooms in Nordeinde because Hofwick was too cut off. He wrote repeatedly to Constantine, urging him to intervene on his behalf to obtain a position at the court of William and Mary. He rebuilt his scientific and intellectual links in anticipation of that move with key members of the Royal Society, particularly with Newton and Boyle. If he was unsuccessful in procuring that administrative post with the new King William, it was not for want of his or his brother's efforts. Constantine approached the new king on at least two separate occasions to press Christian suit for the vacant place on the king's council. In the end, Constantine records in his diary that just as Christian feared, William's lack of interest in science prevented him from valuing any possible con contribution Christian would be able to make on the king's behalf and to conclude that Christian was overqualified in any case for an administrative place, post. And Constantine writes in his diary, following a second letter in which Brother Christian tormented me to ask the king for a place in his council, I spoke to the king and he told me through clenched teeth that he was not sure he was even going to fill the vacancy. When shortly afterwards I told him again he would be well served by my brother, who is of a penetrating intelligence and applies himself assiduously to everything he does, he replied that he thought my brother had ideas which were too high-minded for him to dawdle or some such word with the administrators, so I didn't insist any further. From the point of view of a possible shared Anglo-Dutch intellectual tradition, and this is really my conclusion, what an irony it now seems that the deposed English Catholic King James II was such a passionate advocate of the new science. He was a much more assiduous attender of the Royal Society than any other members of the Royal Society, much more assiduous than Charles II. James was a real scientific virtuoso himself. How ironic it is that the deposed king should have been passionate about new science, while the Dutch new Protestant king, William III, was utterly indifferent to it. How different might it have been? How much more conclusively might there have been a shared Anglo-Dutch scientific tradition had Christian obtained that rather measly post in William III's council for which he pressured his influential brother in letter after letter in late 1689 and early 1690. One can only speculate about how fruitful might have been the collaborative deliberations between Christian Huygens and Sir Isaac Newton if they'd only been in a position to sit down together on a regular basis in some comfortable drawing room in Whitehall or Hampton Court in the years following the Glorious Revolution. Thank you. We want to first of all thank uh, Professor Lisa Jardine for this uh, splendid lecture. And we'd like to also open up the floor now to questions from the audience. We have, what, 10, 15 minutes max <laughs> to keep in the schedule? Thank you, Mr. Dean. Any questions? Questions on anything? There's a question here. No. It's, it's sort of unbearable because it was only pulled down at the end of the 19th century. But there, there, is, there are actually, uh, beginning of the 20th, there are photographs of it. There is the most hideous um, public building 
on the site where it stood. So where um, the Moritz House still is, next to it is this horrible sort of 1960s or maybe it's 1940s building. Um, so no, it's gone. We have the floor plans, we have drawings of it. We actually, as I say, have one photograph. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> yes. Did you find any connections between Hallie and Hoygens? So, what was the, that last thing? Yes. Yes. So that's that's uh, Christian. So that's the, this the same one. Yes. And Hallie is there. I just didn't happen to mention Hallie. Hallie was. Okay. Well, he. Right. So so. Um, yes, it is. Yes. And I'm sorry about the Battle of the Boyne. <laughs> I think he wasn't even as, um, uh, wasn't he to the left of Unitarians? Uh, um, uh, Newton's religion is a, a very vexed question, but for the purposes of the invasion, um, his was the Protestant, low church Protestant faction at the university, um, which had stoutly opposed James II's attempt to impose um, Catholic fellows and heads of house on the university. Uh, so he, he, he became an orthodox hero for, orthodox Protestant hero for a brief while. But then the other question is, did Boykins make a comment on the last of the Pacific? If he read the whole thing through, he must also forget Boykins as being a Protestant. He's a bit startled that master. Right, now I'm going to make a confession now, and it's a confession based on last night's very lovely um, <laughs> three-minute presentation by uh, Dermot McCulloch, this year's uh, winner of the Cundill Prize. And that is, I haven't done enough on the religion of these characters. What Dermot said was that, you know, at our peril do we fail to register the enormous importance of diverse religions to people today and their importance in history. And his book, which I have had the privilege of reading twice, once before it got on the short list and once after it got on the short list, um, really does a beautiful, beautiful job of making you understand how deep into the fabric of the global, of global civilizations, um, churches are seated. I don't know, that's a rather mixed matter. Are woven. How deeply they are woven into that fabric. And as I was listening to him, I was thinking that it's time we did something sensible with these characters, all of whom have quite intriguing religions. The Huygens family, I didn't touch on their religion in Going Dutch, and I haven't in the various um, papers and lectures I've, and, and articles I've done on the Huygens family since. I think it's probably about time that we did. Oh, I'm not, we're not, I'm not straying anywhere near that. <laughs> um, that, that you, anybody, anybody who was astute will have noticed that I firmly ended going Dutch two years before the Battle of the Boyne. <laughs> Uh, book on 
Yes, I did. And in the article, are you the one who discussed the um, competition between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party? Yes. 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 Yes.